Greetings to you from First Baptist Church of Cave Springs, Arkansas. My name, of course, is Ernest Lostavica. It's uh, another beautiful Lord's Day. I trust that you all are in a position to use or appreciate the day the Lord has set aside for us. Um, I pray that Sunday will always be a treasured day of the week for you all. Actually, for all of us, because... It's designed to be a day of rest, and in that rest to give praise and worship to God who consecrated it. I also pray that now that churches are opening up that uh, for congregational worship, that we will follow through and come back face to face and be exactly where we need to be on Sundays to worship and to fellowship together with other believers, our brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, Hebrews 10.25 admonishes us, it says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, uh, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. This day that's approaching is the Lord's day, the coming, the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, when he will bring all evil to uh, judgment, he will bring all of his church to himself, and he will bring on a new kingship on the earth, and it will be a thousand years of rule and reign in righteousness. There will be no, there will be no non-believers, so to speak. So we're looking forward to that. The day of the Lord's return, and at the end of the book of the Revelation, Jesus said, surely I come quickly. That means once that situation is started, it will happen very, very quickly. And what was our reply? And the saints reply at the end of Revelation it says, Amen, even so come Lord Jesus. That is our prayer, that is our expectation, that is our hope and our joy, that the chaos that's in this world has not much longer to live. In another place, Jesus said, I will come unexpectedly, like a thief in the night. You can't say, okay, the Lord's coming next week. We don't know. Only God the Father knows. And one day he'll say, son, go and get your bride. Take your church out of the world. And then he comes, and the world will be left in tribulation. And elsewhere, he says, it will happen in the twinkling of an eye. It'll happen so quickly that no one will have a chance to kneel down and say, God, forgive me. It'll be too, too late. So to be ready, one must know the Lord Jesus personally as Lord and Savior. All 66 books of the Bible show that there's but one way, one way to achieve eternal life, and that way is by faith in the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Well, we're in the book of Acts, chapter 28, <clears throat> the last chapter of Acts. We'll be doing the first half of it today. It's the end of the third missionary journey of Paul, <clears throat> where he ends up in Rome itself, as promised by the Lord Jesus Christ. says, Paul, you will minister to me in Rome. So, if you're... If you have your Bibles, we're in chapter 28. We'll be looking at verses 1 through 16 this morning. And our study in the book of the Acts of the Apostles are taken from detailed historical facts recorded by uh, Luke. Luke, the physician to Paul, who wrote <clears throat> the book of Luke, the, uh, Luke's, the Gospel of Luke, he wrote the book of Acts also and the apostles as recorded in their acts were all empowered by the holy spirit as promised by the lord jesus christ himself he promised his epistles his apostles that they would receive power of the holy spirit and that's in acts chapter one and then in chapter two we began to see the results of that power and it says, many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. Well, Paul, even in our study today, is still showing those signs and wonders. They followed him about 
as part of his ministry. He had the power to perform miracles. He was able to bring people back from the dead. He was able to heal. He was able to do uh, exercise uh, demons from those possessed. He had all the power of the Holy Spirit simply because of who he was. He was an apostle chosen by the Lord himself and empowered to do signs and wonders and he was sent to the Gentiles. For the last few weeks we've been following Paul's third missionary journey and we see God's protection shown to Paul. Paul trusted the promises of Jesus in his ministry to the Gentiles and Paul suffered many hardships, many hardships, scourgings, prisons, shipwrecks, and a near fatal stoning. Yet Paul persevered and continued to preach the gospel and give God the glory in all things. In chapter 28, verses 1 through 16, we find Paul safe and sound from shipwreck, miraculously washed up on the island of Melita, which today is called Malta, and with him, 276 souls, 276 men that were on that sailing ship that was totally destroyed, yet all 276 came safely ashore onto the beaches of Malta, a miracle in itself. Yet it was because they were under God's protection because of Paul. Well, reading now our lesson, we see God's hands once more on his chosen apostle, Paul. Verse 1 of chapter 28 is where we begin. We'll work with the first six verses to begin with. And it says, When they were escaped, then they knew that the island was called Melita, and the barbarous people showed us no little kindness. For they kindled a fire, received us every one because of the present rain and because of the cold. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat, fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang onto his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he had escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Howbeit they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly, but after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. Our God is an awesome God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, again for this opportunity to read your word, to look at it closely, to give you the praise and the glory. Yes, the Apostle Paul was a great evangelist. Yes, he was a great missionary. But his greatness came through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's you, Lord. We give you all the praise and the glory. Help us, Lord, to lock into that power today as individuals who believe that we know we're chosen. We are yours. We're now children of God. Help us, Lord, to use that fellowship in the power of the Holy Spirit. Forgive us, Lord, our sin. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, when we see what's happening here, and we see that there's 276 men that did not perish at all. None were lost. We see God's hand once more on his chosen apostle, Paul. Verse 1, he said he was safe on land, but on an island on which the speak, uh, people spoke a different language uh, besides Greek or Latin. So if you were well-versed in Greek and Latin and you came to Malta, you could not understand at all anything the people were saying. It would be gibberish. It would be like us going into the jungles of South America and listening to the tribes speak their language. There's no way. And the word for that in Greek was, uh, we would say gibberish. The Greek said barber, barbar. So that's why Luke identified these people as barbarous. They spoke a different language from Latin or Greek. Well, 
verse 2 calls them that, and it might lead us to think that they were uh, uncivilized, uh, maybe savage people. That's not the case. They were good and kind and caring people. They just seemed to be speaking because they were speaking what they couldn't understand. They were just foreigners, which, well, it was cold, it was rainy. They built a fire. Well, it was still the beginning of winter, and it was, everyone was soaking wet from being swimming in the sea. I can imagine they were very, very, very cold in the throes of uh, hypothermia. So they built a fire. And then verse 3, everybody pitched in carrying wood to those fires. And Paul, when he picked up a bundle of sticks with a very poisonous snake in it, with a, well, <laughs> when that snake <laughs> hit the fire, it woke him up. I'm sure he was dormant for the winter. But the fire warmed him up just in time for him to bite Paul. And verse 4 said the people knew that this was a very, very poisonous snake, that there was no hope for the one that was bitten. In fact, it would be dead in a few minutes. The people knew, and they jumped to the conclusion that Paul must be some vile sinner that had judgment against him by the gods. He had survived a shipwreck and all the troubles of the storm only to come to the land and then be judged by the gods by letting him get bit by a poisonous viper. Well, don't we sometimes have that same opinion when we see someone in the throes of some type of uh, tragic uh, thing in their life and we say, is sin finally caught up with them? Well, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way at all. And Job was so accused. His friends came. Job was in a terrible situation where he lost his health, lost all his wealth, lost everything. And his friends said, repent of your sins, Job, and pray that God will have mercy on you. But we know Job, according to the word of God, did not sin. Job 1 and 8 says, my servant Job, look at my servant Job, but there is none like him in the earth a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and shuns evil. Yet he was totally devastated. Well, you can't judge people's uh, trials and tribulations and say, well, they were such great sinners that they're having a rough life. These people of Malta said this man survived the sea, but now is going to die. He must really be bad. Well, look at verse 5. Paul pays no attention to the snake, shakes it off into the fire, warms himself. Wow, that's godly protection. Yet it's promised in God's word. Said uh, in the book of Mark, says they can handle vipers and not be harmed. Only because of God's protection. Verse 6 says, uh, it just reiterates that we serve a mighty God who can handle things like this. After a while of watching Paul with no ill effects, they changed their opinion of him. Now he's not a vile sinner deserving judgment. Now they say he must be a God. Well, what kind of gods did they have? Mythological gods. Well, Paul was not a God, but he was empowered by the Creator of all. He was empowered by the Holy Spirit. And you see him as the apostle that was granted these gifts of healing and relief from disease and relief from poisons and all those things. Empowered by the Holy Spirit of God, he had the power of the one true God. He did perform miracles by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Acts 14 and 11 and 12, verses 11 and 12, which Acts 14, at Lystra, Paul and Barnabas healed a lame man in the name of Jesus. And the people said, the gods have come down among us as men. Well, they weren't gods, but they called Barnabas Jupiter, and they called Paul Mercurius. You see, God took good care of his apostles. That's our theme for our lesson today as we continue. When God calls one to his ministry, 
when we are truly called by God to proclaim the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, God will ensure that that ministry will be completed. We've watched Paul through half the book of Acts in his first, second, and third missionary journeys and how God provided for him, kept him, and he was very productive everywhere that Paul went. People were saved. Uh, churches were planted. The word of God continued to go and blossom. So that's the insurance of God to each of his children. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. That's our assignment and that's our ministry. Well, let's move on to verses 7 through 10. It says, In the same quarters were possessions of the chief man of the island, whose name was Publius, who received us and lodged us three days courteously. And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in and prayed, laid his hands on him, and healed him. So when this was done, others also, which had diseases in the island, came and were healed, who also honored us with many honors, and when we departed, they laded us with such things as were necessary. Paul did not ask for any recompense. He healed because of compassion for his fellow man. So Paul and all the men now stranded on this island were extended every courtesy, compliments of God. For the first three days, Paul, Luke, and Aristarchus were housed with the chief man, Publius, and he was courteous to them, provided everything they needed. Paul, being Paul, found that Publius's father was seriously ill, gravely ill, with fever and intestinal hemorrhaging, and later this disease, so prevalent there in Malta, became called the Maltese fever. One of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, of course, to the apostles was the gift of healing. And Paul healed the man, and for the next three months, the rest of the winter, Paul and Luke, as the physician, healed these people, and they were kept busy because of all those that needed attention were brought to them. Verse 10 says the people honored them with many honors and loaded them with such things as were necessary. They wanted for no thing, simply because of their compassion and love for the people. The writer Luke does not record any events of salvation in this time of three months or the planning of a church there. But what is recorded is the God-given gifts of hospitality, friendship, compassion, which probably paved the way for other Christians who came later. Reading further, verses 11 and 12, And after three months we departed in a ship of Alexandria, which had wintered in the isle, whose sign was Castor and Pollux. And landing at Syracuse, we tarried there three days. So, three months, the winter is gone. It's now heading towards spring. The harshness of the winter has passed. The party took another supply ship, which had the good fortune to get to Malta's south side before winter, and then spent and wintered there on the south side of Malta. Note the names of that ship, Castor and Pollux. Castor and Pollux were the twin sons of the mythological god Zeus. They are also in the constellation which we call Gemini, the twins. The figureheads on that ship were replicas of those two sons of Zeus. And they were uh, the patron deities of sailors. Little did they know that the god of all creation the God of all weather, all seas, all of everything, had them in their hands with a precious cargo named Paul, the chosen vessel to carry the gospel to the Gentiles. And sailing to the island of Sicily, they reached harbor at Syracuse, and for three days they spent there. There was no record of any events happening there, so it must have been an uneventful three days of rest for Paul and his companions. Then verses 13 and 14 says, From thence we fetched a compass 
and came to Regium, and after one day the south wind blew, and we came the next day to Patelolai, where we found brethren and were desired to tarry with them seven days, and so we went toward Rome. Fetched a compass. That means they sailed around the east coast of Sicily, northward to Regium, which is on the western tip of the boot of Italy. And after a day, the south wind blew, and they had smooth sailing to Put Putelioli, where we found other brethren, or other Christians. Paul and Luke and Aristarchus found Christian brothers and sisters and stayed with them seven days. Potelolai being the Bay of Naples today, where grain ships were unloaded, of course, at that time. Rome's harbor was not deep enough to handle large grain-laden ships. So they were unloaded at Putelo, Potelolai, or Naples. From there, the rest of the journey is inland toward Rome. We we'll read now our closing verses uh, 15 and 16. From thence, from this place called Putelolai, from thence when the brethren heard of us, they came to meet us as far as Appii, Appii Forum and the three taverns, whom when Paul saw, he thanked God and took courage. And when we came to Rome, let's just stop on 15 for now. The brethren heard of us. They came to meet us as far as Appii Forum and the three taverns. This trade route that they were moving with the uh, entourage of the prisoners and the grain-laden vehicles and whatever it was, they found Christian brothers and sisters. Where did they come from? Well, they were there because the Christians had scattered from the day of Pentecost all through the Roman Empire, and Rome was a big place. When we read this last segment of the journey, we don't know how many days it took, but Paul meets Christians all the way, all the way. Every time he went to from one city to another, they were always there, ready and waiting for him. They had heard that Paul had come and they were meeting him and encouraged him all the way because the teaching of Paul was well known. And by history, our biblical history, Paul had already written his epistle to the Romans earlier. So this great book that Paul had written, this great letter to the church at Rome, it is, it is the most basic theological book of salvation that we have in all the Bible. It was so simple, so explicit. It was all faith cometh by, uh, well, salvation comes by faith. And in that epistle, he had already promised to come see them at Rome. Verse 15 tells us they came to Paul as far as the FBI Forum, 43 miles south of Rome. And then the three taverns, which is 33 miles uh, south of Rome, and this route that he was traveling on was for travelers, um, merchants especially alike, along this trade route. Rome was a really, really populous city. Uh, in the year 1941, there was discovered in an inscription at a place called Ostia, and it was dated A.D. 14. When Jesus Christ was a teenager, they had written that Rome had a population of over four million citizens. Four million there in Rome, Italy. That's a city-state. God saw fit to go to Rome, and that's the reason he went to Rome. That's the reason the, the believers from Pentecost, when they went back to Rome, they spread the gospel throughout all that area. Many, many, many people. And when Paul saw all of them, it said he, had, he thanked God and took courage. That's what we do when we meet together with believers, when we're in a strange city, and we go to a church of like belief, and they're just brothers and sisters in Christ. It's like you've known them all your life. 
and they encourage you. If you're a stranger in town, I urge you to go to the church because they will make you feel at home and they will encourage you. The gospel that spread there from the day of Pentecost, when Paul saw them, he said, thank God, thank God. You see, he didn't have anything to do with that. Yet God was there before him. Even today we find blessings and joy just by meeting brothers and sisters in Christ in our travels. Well, we have Christian fellowship and friends wherever we find the word of the Lord preached. Verse 16, when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard. But Paul was suffered to dwell by himself with the soldier that kept him. Uh, the centurion's mission is completed. All the prisoners are delivered to the Roman guard except Paul. He is God's man. God made that perfectly clear on all this perilous journey, and I believe the centurion recognized this, that Paul was very special and was to be treated as such. Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. We'll learn more about that next week, but right now, I believe even today, a believer is under the protection of his Father in heaven. That is a guarantee. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He is there with us in the person of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Paul wrote in Romans 8, 38 and 39, he says, nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Romans 8, 38, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is a promise that belongs to all who believe and obey in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, the question is, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ today personally? Uh, if you have answered his call, he has a plan for you, and you, you hard to tell all you meet exactly what you know about the Lord Jesus Christ. You are to be a witness of your faith. Be a witness of your salvation. Be a witness of your joy and hope in the Lord. So, he's the one that gave us eternal life. Your life is now in his hands and your only purpose is to obey the leading of the Holy Spirit, just as Paul did. So we need to praise God daily for his plan for you. Uh, praise God for those around you, encourage you, and provide for your needs. And above all, praise God for his plan of salvation, that there is a way to come to eternal life for all, whosoever will may come. Today, God can still do the greatest miracle of all time, that he will save the life of the most vile of sinners. God does not do it arbitrarily. He does it by the sinner's admission of guilt and recognizing the hopelessness of a sinful condition. God always looks at an individual's heart. You can't lie to God and say, Lord, I want to be saved and not mean it. He knows. If that heart is humbled before God, when the human heart bows down before God and admits that he's a sinner. God knows. So when we ask for forgiveness with that, what the Bible calls contrite heart, where we have taken away all of ourselves and given ourselves to him, he knows it. He sees our repentance. He t sees us turn from our sinful, wicked ways. God, through his amazing grace and mercy, forgives and forgets the sins which are repented of. And the miracle happens. This apostle Paul wrote these simple words to the church at Ephesus to explain the miracle of salvation. You know it probably. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's that simple, that it is a gift of God. All these things that Paul suffered with through and throughout, 
he did it knowing that God was in charge and that his life was in God's hands and that gave him boldness and courage and it gave him the ability to suffer through pain suffering of all types imprisonment no matter what he held up the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and said in him will I trust well even this very day God is still speaking to us through the Apostle Paul we're reading his words we're reading his words that he wrote to the Ephesians. We read all of his, his letters in the Bible, and they're all just simply speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we read them today, the Lord is still using his words to train us, to lead us, and to guide us. So it behooves us to listen. I thank you for this time. Let us give it to the Lord in Jesus' name. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the technology that brings this word into anyone's pocket as a phone, as a laptop, as a television set in the living room. Lord God, we thank you for such miracles. But it's all in the power of the Holy Spirit. It is your creation. It all belongs to you. Father, help us to come back to our churches Bless those churches that are opening their doors, and Lord God, bless the congregations that are coming back to edify and uplift each other. And Father, we thank you for bringing us through this time, and we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.